Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Library. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my honor to serve as director of the library here in Ann Arbor and the museum in Grand Rapids. We are very pleased to have you here for our first program of the fall season, and I want you to know that we've missed you very much through the summer, so we're really glad to see you all again. This evening's program is brought to you through the support of the National Archives, Archives and Records Administration, which is our parent organization, in collaboration with financial support from the Ford Presidential Foundation. We truly could not do what we do without the Foundation's support. Tonight we have the honor of hosting Max Holland, an accomplished journalist and author who will discuss the fabled secret source known only as Deep Throat in his new book, Leak, Why Mark Felt Became Deep Throat. Max is a graduate of Antioch College and a music major at that, and then did later journalism studies at the universities of New Mexico, Nebraska, and later Johns Hopkins. He got his start in journalism at the Lincoln Star, where he wore many hats. Currently, he is the editor of Washington Decoded, which is an independent online monthly magazine, which began featuring original articles and book reviews about American history and current activities in 2007. He is also a contributing editor at The Nation magazine and the Wilson Quarterly, and sits on the editorial advisory board of the International Journal of Intelligence and Counterintelligence. His articles have appeared in both general and scholarly publications, including the Atlantic Monthly, American Heritage, The Washington Post, New York Times, many others, including The Wall Street Journal, as well as Studies in Intelligence, The Journal of Cold War Studies, and Reviews in American History. So for a non-academic person, he has some pretty heavy-duty academic journals. Max is the author, editor, or co-author of six books, including two addressing LBJ's taped recordings regarding the Kennedy assassination, and his newest book just published called Blind Over Cuba, regarding the Kennedy administration and how a gap in photo coverage led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Max has a long history of doing research here at the Ford Library since he, his first visit here was in 1983, just two years after the library opened. He has been in residence here all this week doing research for his next book, which is titled A Need to Know, Inside the Warren Commission. And since 2014 is the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Warren Commission report, of which President Ford was the last surviving member, you can be sure that Max will be on our radar screen for a future presentation on that topic. Max has received numerous research grants and fellowships from presidential foundations and other organizations. Most recently, he was awarded a Ford Pre Foundation research travel grant for work on this new book. He is clearly no stranger to investigative journalism and historical research and has put those skills together in this new book. One of the things that fascinates me about the new one is that it's 200 pages of text and 85 pages of footnotes. So this is scrupulously researched and you all can follow his track and thinking if you care to do so. So we have all heard about putting Watergate behind us. Tonight we're going to have Max put Watergate in front of us. Please Please welcome Max Holland to the podium. Thank you very much. Before I get started, I'd like to express my appreciation to the Ford Library and the Foundation for inviting me to speak and supporting my research. I'd like to single out Kate Murray for all the work she's done in arranging my talk and publicizing it. David Horrocks, the former supervisory archivist who was my champion here, and Elaine for her gracious, graciousness while I've been in residence. <clears throat> There's no place more fitting to talk about, Mark Feld, of course, than the Ford Library, with one exception, which is the Nixon Library. <laughs> Ford, Gerald Ford, only aspired to be the Speaker of the House, Republican control of the, of the House, but instead he became President, in large part because of what Mark Felt did in the fall of 1972. Now we are here because exactly 40 years ago this summer, five men broke into the Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate office complex, which is that middle building. One of the five men was the security chief 
for the Nixon re-election campaign, and there's where the tale starts. <clears throat> the Nixon campaign immediately denied any responsibility for what it called a third-rate burglary, and as hard as it may be to believe now, during the fall of 1972, the Watergate break-in was not a big campaign issue. McGovern occasionally tried to make it one, but it was not. And of course, Nixon won a landslide victory, surpassed only by the 1936 and 1964 landslides. I worked for McGovern in 1972, and of course, I believed there was much more to Watergate, and I wondered if the truth would ever come out. But he didn't even manage to carry his home state of South Dakota in that election. Five months after the election, the Nixon administration was in grave danger, embroiled in the worst scandal to hit the presidency since the Teapot Dome scandal of the 1920s, and eventually the first impeachment process in 100 years, culminating, of course, in Richard Nixon's resignation in August 1974. There are a few other presidents I wish had resigned to, but Nixon is the only one all because of that third-rate burglary. Now, before getting to the nuts and bolts of my book, I'd like to mark the 50th anniversary of a movie called The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Now, you might ask, and fairly, what could this movie possibly have to do with Watergate, apart from starring two of Richard Nixon's favorite actors, John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart? In truth, it's a Hollywood Western, but I think it's one of the best films on journalism ever made. Without getting too deeply into the plot, let me just reprise it. An esteemed U.S. Senator, played by Jimmy Stewart, is on a railroad car, returning to this tiny town of Shinbone. A reporter's interviewing him and wonders why Jimmy Stewart is returning to this town to attend the funeral of a rancher, a man who was a drunk and whose life, by all accounts, had never amounted to much. Stewart decides to set the record straight once and for all, get the truth out and give the, his friend, the rancher, the credit he's always deserved. The great bulk of the movie is then told in flashback because on the railroad car, Stewart's about 60 years old. <clears throat> so the movie's told in flashback. A young Jimmy Stewart comes to Shinbone. He's a lawyer in a lawless town. He quickly gets entangled with a villain named Liberty Valance, a ruthless outlaw who's been terrorizing Shinbone. They eventually have a gunfight, and to everyone's amazement, Jimmy Stewart, who hardly knows how to handle a revolver, kills Liberty Valance. He soon learns that he didn't actually kill Liberty Valance, it was John Wayne, the character played by John Wayne. But Stewart is the one who achieves fame and renown and goes on to become elected the first senator from that territory when it becomes a state, and even the US ambassador to Great Britain. Privately, he is always chagrined that his career is built on a lie and a deception, but John Wayne will not have it any other way. After Stewart finishes telling this story to the reporter on the train, the movie flashes back to the present. Stewart's relieved to finally told the truth, that he's finally told the truth. To his surprise, the reporter starts ripping up his notes. He says, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's what we're up against here, because we really have a depiction of two reporters that is akin to a Hollywood Western. They're the good guys. Or as one scholar put it, it's high noon in Washington with two white-hatted young reporters at one end of the street, aided by a mysterious source named Deep Throat, and the black-hatted president at the other end. And the good guys win. Truth, their only weapon saves the day. That legend was first presented in 1974 in the book 
all the president's men. Subsequently, when these two reporters were played by Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford, they became icons of the profession. Every bit as enduring and powerful as the man who supposedly shot Liberty Valance. But just like director John Ford, I submit that the truth is far more interesting than the fable. As the editor of the Washingtonian magazine once, sense, once said, the forces that work behind the Watergate scandal tell you an awful lot more about how things happen in Washington. And to subscribe or to continue to subscribe to the fairy tale is to have a terribly skewed view of what actually happened, what Gerald Ford aptly called our long national nightmare. Now my interest in Watergate began in 2007. That's two years after Mark Felt came forward or his family brought him forward and revealed him to be the secret source named Deep Throat. <clears throat> in 2007, the University of Texas opened the Deep Throat portion of the Woodward and Bernstein papers, which had been sold for $5 million to the university. I've done a lot of work in archives, and I know a basic rule of thumb is whatever you think happened, the papers are going to show something different. It may be pretty insignificant, it may be powerful, but it's going to be different. So I wondered what is in the Woodward and Bernstein papers that is different than what we think happened. So I started reading up, bringing myself up to speed. I hadn't read any books about Watergate for 20 years. <clears throat> One of the first things I noticed is how nimble Woodward had been in describing Felt's motives. In All the President's Men in 1974, Felt was a principled whistleblower, a conscience-stricken man who was trying to save the presidency itself from Richard Nixon. But in The Secret Man, which was the book Woodward wrote about Felt in 2005, Felt was more, the explanation was much more pedestrian. Felt was a bureaucrat in the FBI trying to save the Bureau from the clutches of Richard Nixon. Oh, and by the way, Felt also wanted to be the FBI director. <laughs> a little later in oral histories recorded at the Nixon Library, Woodward sort of weaved all these, all these explanations together. That he was principled, that he wanted to protect the FBI, and oh, by the way, he wanted to be FBI director. <clears throat> now, I've done a lot of work on the Kennedy assassination, which involves studying the FBI of the 1960s. And there's one thing that's very clear, is that the insular culture of the FBI, it's very unique in Washington, and it could not be made overnight. So the idea that even Richard Nixon could somehow take over and change the FBI overnight into a tool of the White House just doesn't wash with me. The next thing that happened was when Felt died in December 2008. And the eulogies in the newspapers, they were all trying to wrap themselves in the Woodward and Bernstein mantle. And then there was Woodward's eulogy delivered in January 2009, in which he seemed to return back to his original explanation. Mark's great decision was his refusal to be silenced. He was a truth teller. Well, if there's one thing Mark felt was not, it was a truth teller. <clears throat> I began my research with a simple question. According to the tapes that Richard Nixon surreptitiously made, in mid-October 1972, about three weeks before the election, he learned that Mark Felt was leaking to the press. He didn't know, know his code name was Deep Throat, only people inside the Washington Post knew that, but Nixon learned that Felt was leaking to the press. And I wondered why he didn't fire the son of the gun right away, or why not right after the election when he'd won this huge mandate. So I called William Ruckelshaus. 
William Ruckelshaus, you might remember, was very briefly made the FBI director in 1973 in an emergency move. He was director for about two months. He's being sworn in here. A very young man, so he's still around. He's an investment banker in Seattle now. And I asked him, when Nixon asked you to be the acting FBI director, what did he tell you about Mark Felt? He, and Rucklesshaus answered, Nixon told me he's a leaker and watch out for him. And in fact, I fired him for leaking, or I forced him to resign for leaking. And that took me back because I had never heard that story that Felt was forced out. Because if you read Woodward's books, Felt left because he wanted to take advantage of a better pension. What Ruckelshaus told me next was even more surprising. He told me that in 2005, when Mark Felt came forward, that he, Ruckelshaus, called Bob Woodward to tell him the exact circumstances of Felt's very abrupt departure from the FBI in May 1973, just about a year after the break-in at the Watergate. And Woodward told Ruckelshaus, this is very interesting and important information you've told me, and I'm going to make sure it will get out. Well, this was 2007, and I interviewed Ruckus House in about 2008 or 9 for the first time, and he had, and Woodward had nothing, done nothing to get that information out. He hadn't written an article in the Washington Post. He hadn't issued a new PS or afterward to his book on Felt. And I wondered, why is Woodward not acting like Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> well, it turns out if you start pulling on that thread, Felt's abrupt departure from the FBI, the whole fairy tale starts to unravel. And this is where I get to the gist of my findings. The first finding is there was a terrific war of succession at the FBI that was fought in the most vicious bureaucratic warfare you can imagine. And that's what Mark Felt was engaged in. When he leaked information about the FBI's investigation of Watergate, it wasn't because the FBI's investigation wasn't going anywhere. It was to incite Richard Nixon against the acting director of the Bureau, L. Patrick Gray. After Hoover died, Nixon had surprised everyone and appointed a man who's as gray as his last name, complete dark horse, and he made him acting director because he didn't want a confirmation battle in 1972. He didn't want the Democrats who controlled the Senate Judiciary Committee you know, to launch into an open season attacking the FBI. So he made Gray the acting director, and that gave Felt the opening that he thought he could use. If he could show that Pat Gray could not control the Bureau, and that the Bureau was leaking sensitive information about a politically sensitive investigation, then he felt Nixon would turn against Pat Gray and appoint an insider who really knew how to run the place. And who would that be? Well, of course, Mark Felt. That was the reason for his leaks to Woodward. Now, my second finding, here's uh, Pat Gray, Two or three day Gray, that was uh, Mark Felt's derogatory nickname for Pat Gray. Mm -hmm. Because Gray, in order to win acceptance within the Bureau, spent at least two days a week visiting field offices throughout the country, trying to familiarize himself with operations in the field, with the agents who he felt he needed their support in order to win the permanent appointment as director. My second finding was that Felt didn't just leak to Bob Woodward. In fact, Time Magazine ran a close second to the Washington Post in terms of the disclosures about Watergate. In fact, more of the important stories appeared in Time Magazine, not the Washington Post. And that was because there was a reporter there named Sandy Smith, who had come out of Chicago, who was famous for reporting on the mob in the 40s and 50s. It was said that he knew the mob's pecking order better than the mobsters himself. Um, and he was 
highly trusted by the FBI, and he was known, a known commodity. And therefore, when felt leaked to him, he knew that his identity would be protected. Because you have to remember, Bob Woodward was a cub reporter, completely unproven. Felt really didn't know whether he could trust him. And as it turned out, he could not. So far from a principled whistleblower, the Hal Holbrook character played in All the President's Men, Felt was absolutely contemptuous of the media. And even Woodward hints at this in All the President's Men when he says that Felt often talked about the press's inexactitude and short attention span. And to that, I would argue the degree to which it could be manipulated. Felt saw it as a pliable tool to get him what he wanted, the top of the FBI pyramid. And he had no intention or purpose of removing Richard Nixon from office. Nixon was his ticket to the top. He was the man who was going to appoint Felt director of the FBI. He had to stay in office. George McGovern certainly wasn't going to appoint Mark Felt. Now when I felt, and I don't mean to make a pun, but when I thought I had figured this out, I was very, very proud of myself until I ran across this article in the New York Times, which appeared on the front page in August 1973. So this is about three months after Felt had left the FBI, and about seven months or so before All the President's Men was published. And that arrow points to this paragraph. There have been reports over the last year that at least some of the details of the involvement of officials of the White House and the Nixon reelection campaign and the Watergate cover-up and related events have come from FBI employees who were disgruntled for one reason or another. In some cases, sources have said, leaks from bureau agents were intended to prevent the nomination of Mr. Gray as the FBI's permanent director by signaling the White House that he did not have the respect of many agents and could not control them, and that if he were nominated, the bureau would, quote, leak like a sieve. So there it is, back in 1973, what was really going on. The only thing that's wrong with this story is it wasn't FBI agents who were leaking. It was FBI executives who were leaking, or agents at the instruction of executives. Because what's also true, or what becomes apparent, is that Felt didn't do this completely alone. The Bureau was a bunch of fiefdoms. And you had your loyalists, the people whose career you're protected, and they did things for you in order to advance your career. And Felt had executives and agents under him who would do things like leak. Um, one of the things I want to underscore is that he wasn't leaking out of sheer bitterness because he was upset or resentful at not becoming FBI director. It really was a media influence operation. And in, in, in true influence operation, you're trying to incite your target to act in a certain way. In this case, achieve an end, which is to get the nomination as permanent director. In one of his conversations with Felt, Woodward said Felt talked about a switchblade mentality that existed in the Nixon White House. But where there was really a switchblade mentality was at the upper echelons of the FBI. They played hardball, and these were very hard-bitten men. Anyone who had worked under Hoover was going to be a hard-bitten man, because Hoover was very capricious and you could easily be derailed in your career for the most minor infraction. My third major finding was that a lot of what Felt told Woodward was factually untrue. And the reason for that was he really didn't care about the truth. What he cared about was inciting the White House 
against Pat Gray. Or if worse came to worse and Pat Gray somehow was nominated, which was a contingency he had to consider, inciting Senate Democrats to vote against Pat Gray's nomination. So about a third, a third to a half of what Felt told both Sandy Smith and Bob Woodward is just completely false. My fourth finding has to do with Woodward and Bernstein, because you can't really write a book about Mark Felt with all, also without writing about them. I think they probably believed that Felt was, you know, the man they depicted him to be in all the president's men at the time, because probably the only actor who played Mark Felt better than Hal Holbrook was Mark Felt himself. He fooled Woodward into thinking that they were allies against this criminal enterprise, AKA the Nixon White House. But Woodward is not obtuse. And at some point, he had to realize that this could not possibly have been the case. And I think probably a time you could mark as the latest point at which he had to realize this was true was in 1992. 20 years after Watergate, the FBI opened all, all its records. And Woodward said he went there and read them. Now, if you read the FBI records, you'll find out that there is no instance of anything important related to Watergate that the FBI didn't know before the Washington Post published it. In other words, the Post didn't reveal Watergate except to the public, which is why the public thinks the Post revealed Watergate. But the FBI was days, weeks, sometimes months ahead of the Washington Post. But of course, they weren't disclosing their findings in public, they were disclosing them only to the grand jury. And in fact, they were upset when their findings appeared, sometimes almost verbatim, in the Washington Post. So when Woodward read the FBI, re FBI records, he had to realize that Felt was playing some other kind of game. At the same time, I'm a journalist myself, and I don't want to denigrate what Woodward did, because when the number two man at the FBI talks, any responsible reporter listens. And if Felt was willing to talk to Woodward, it was Woodward's obligation to listen and try and corroborate and write up everything he was told. So even if he was merely reporting or reflecting what the FBI already knew, that's no small accomplishment because, of course, Watergate was a political crime and it was important in terms of the public interest to get as much information out before the election. So I you know, would be first in line to acknowledge the accomplishments of Woodward, Bernstein, and the Washington Post in the fall of 1972. Where I differ is in their depiction in the book of how they accomplished what they did. After I finished my book, I went to the papers of Alan Pakula, who was the director of all the President's Men. And it was too late to include it in my book, but Looking at those papers in which Pakula interviewed everybody who had worked at the Post because he wanted to make a movie with a great deal of realism in it, I realized really kind of what happened in All the President's Men. If you remember, in the late 60s and early 70s, there was this thing called the New Journalism. The Truman Capote's book, In Cold Blood, was one of the first examples of it, in which a reporter put himself into the story. Norman Mailer's book, Armies of the Night, was another example of it. That was a book that Bernstein, in particular, admired greatly. And in fact, the voice that Woodward and Bernstein adopted in their book, writing about themselves in the third person, is exactly what Mailer did. You know, Mailer confronts the Pentagon, marches up the steps. That's the same voice that Woodward and Bernstein adopted. And the rules in the new journalism is that you put yourself in the center of the story, and it really didn't matter 
always what the facts were, it mattered what your perception of the facts were. So Woodward and Bernstein didn't have to go out and try and discern Felt's motive. They could just write whatever they thought the motive was. They took a lot of liberties. What I've posted up there is Woodward's typewritten notes from one of his meetings with Felt. Now this meeting is reproduced in All the President's Men. But when you compare the notes with the text in All the President's Men, a couple things become apparent. In the text, quotes are used around colorful phrases like switchblade mentality. In the book, everything is a quote. Sentences, words, are moved around to make what felt supposedly said much more coherent. What's also troubling is that in the book, felt is quoted as saying things that are not in the notes. I asked Woodward about this before I published my book, and he said, well, you must remember that when we wrote the book, it was about a year or so after my meetings with Felt, and as I reviewed my notes, a lot started coming back to me. That's why many more things are in quotes and why some things that are not in the notes are in the text of the book. And I submit, if that's true, I've got a Brooklyn Bridge for a sale. Now, why does all this matter? I was interviewed about three months ago by Robert Redford Production Company, which is doing a documentary on Watergate. And he was a very bright young man. He had a lot of good questions. And after about two and a half hours, uh, the director spoke up. And if you know how documentaries are made, it's really the director has the final say on what goes in the documentary. And after I laid this all out in copious detail for two hours, he said, what, why does it matter what Mark felt, why he did it? He, you know, he just did it. Well, I submit it matters for several reasons. I may be old fashioned, but I do think facts matter. On a very elementary level, it simply fills a void that's been present ever since we learned about this fellow, Deep Throat. In his New York Times review of The Secret Man, Woodward's book, the late Christopher Hitchens rightly called this episode the single most successive use, successful use of the media by an anonymous, unelected official with an agenda of his own. And I submit we have to understand what that agenda was in order to understand the Watergate episode. Now, this doesn't exculpate Nixon or get him off the hook or mean he shouldn't have been embroiled in an impeachment process, or, but we do have to understand why Felt did what he did. It also reminds us who the true heroes were, who the true principled whistleblowers were. Earl Silbert was the chief prosecutor. The case he brought against the burglars, the five burglars that were caught, and then E. Howard Hunt and Gordon Liddy, who were their handlers, was brought to trial in January 73. His case proceeded too slowly in, in terms of political terms, but in terms of ultimate justice, it did what it was supposed to do. When Silbert and his co attorneys were replaced by a special prosecutor in the spring of 1973, they handed over literally a roadmap which the special prosecutor followed almost without exception. So Felt, I would say, deserves a lot less credit as opposed to someone like Earl Silbert, who conduct conducted himself with great integrity. Also, who were the whistleblowers? Well, Hugh Sloan, who was the treasurer at the Republican Committee to reelect President Nixon, always told the truth, both to the grand jury and the Senate Watergate Committee. A bookkeeper at the, at the Committee to reelect, Judith Hoback, spoke more times to the FBI, I think a total of a dozen times over a three-month period, 
in the summer and fall of 1972. And she was one of the most important witnesses because she had seen the flow of funds to Gordon Liddy. And then there's James McCord, who was one of the burglars who was apprehended. And when Earl Silbert succeeded in closing the jaws of justice, McCord was the first one who cracked and told the truth. He wrote a letter to Judge Sirica in March 73 and said perjury had been committed during the trial of the Watergate burglars. And finally, there's poor, hapless Pat Gray. Because despite the odds, Nixon did nominate Gray to be the acting, the permanent director of the FBI. Basically, because he didn't have too many choices left by 1973. And Pat Gray had not known about the cover up. And so during his nomination hearings, he told, th he revealed things such as the fact that he was informing John Dean about the pace of the Watergate investigation, who the FBI was seeing, what they were asking him, that completely blew Watergate up into the major scandal that it became. Because the Senate suddenly wanted John Dean to testify at the confirmation hearings for Pat Gray. And that was eventually what forced Dean, who had not been really a public figure associated with Watergate, it was Gray's testimony that suddenly surfaced Dean, and within a month, Dean became a state, turned against the Nixon White House and became a state witness. It also matters because understanding Felt's role gives us a proper perspective on the role of the press. As I said before, I would be the first to stand in line to congratulate Woodward and Bernstein for their reporting. Because what did it do? Their reporting and also Time and other newspapers and magazines. First of all, it kept Watergate in the news. Although it was not an election issue, and after November, for about two months, it almost completely disappeared because of lack of interest. But it kept the Nixon White House making non-denials and what they call non-denial denials time and again. And that created an enormous credibility gap for the Nixon White House. So that by 1973, when they started, when they were forced to admit involvement, the press turned on the Nixon White House with a ferocity that we've seldom seen. And after that, the Nixon White House was laboring under terrific burden of not having come clean when they could have told the bad news and Richard Nixon in all likelihood would have been reelected president anyway. By keeping the Watergate story in the news, it also influenced Judge Sirica. Now, the truth is he was known as Maximum John before the stories in the Washington Post. And he probably would have thrown the book at the burglars anyway. But he did read those stories, and he felt the truth hadn't been told in his courtroom. So he did impose the maximum sentences on the men who were convicted for the break-in, the seven men. And of course, it also influenced the Senate to investigate Watergate, the hearings that we all, all of us who were alive then, watched raptly during the summer of 73. Now the fact is, I personally think that the Senate Democrats, even if there had been less coverage in the Washington Post, would have mounted an investigation anyway. Because there's a saying in Washington, the most dangerous place in Washington is between a camera and a senator. <laughs> So I think there's ample reason to believe there would have been an investigation. But the fact is, Sam Irvin did read the Washington Post, and he did notice the coverage. And in fact, they asked Bob Woodward about who he thought might be a good investigator for the Senate Watergate Committee. The press coverage also served as a prophylactic, because as long as there were stories in the Post and Time and Newsweek, Earl Silbert could go about his business of giving, getting a deposition from John Mitchell, who had been head of the Republican 
uh, committee to reelect President Nixon, and nobody in the Justice Department blinked an eye. So in that respect, the press served an important role. Finally, understanding why Mark Felt did what he did lifts the lid on a complex, somewhat adversarial, but symbiotic relationship between the press and the government and sources. And it's a reminder of how the press can be manipulated by people in the government who have an agenda of their own, which might not be the agenda they, lead, they want you to think. We need only look at the performance of the press in the run-up to an invasion of Iraq to know how the press can be influenced by sources in its zen to get a front page story about weapons of mass destruction. Or we can be reminded in Iran-Contra, it was a Lebanese newspaper, not an American newspaper, that printed the story that led to the what was called the Iran-Contra affair in the 1980s. So in some, like the film, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, the truth complicates the fairy tale. Despite Bob Woodward and Bob Redford's best efforts, the package isn't as neat and tidy as the one they've presented to us. But it's far more interesting, more human, and more real. Thank you for your attention. First of all, a comment to the audience. If you've not read this book, uh, echoing what was said in the introduction, do not ignore the end notes. They are fabulous and really add to the depth of the book. Appreciate that. Even got a little tired going back and forth all the time, but that's OK. Um, I was surprised and at how naive, I would say, both Gray and Woodward seemed to be about felt. <coughs> Uh, Gray about Felt's ambition. How did he not realize that? Uh, Woodward about Felt's motives and, like you said, the assumption that everything that Felt said was true. It seemed to me Felt is just a very skilled guy, but Woodward and Gray are not supposed to be dummies. And, and, and I have a related follow-up, if that's permissible. Sure. So they're, not, they're naivete, and they're mm -hmm. being naive. Well, uh, uh, there's a very interesting fellow named Donald Santorelli, who is a lawyer in the Justice Department who I interviewed. And he has the distinction of warning Nixon not to put John Dean and Gordon Liddy in the positions that they held, which led to Watergate. He was a very shrewd guy. And he explained Gray to me this way. He said Gray had been a submarine commander in World War II and even during the Korean War, and that was his formative experience. And in the submarine, your executive officer is a man you depend on to run the submarine. And you expect and receive complete loyalty because, of course, it's, it's a, just a very perilous operation virtually at all times. And Gray treated Felt as his executive officer and if you look at the memos that Felt sent to Gray, such as, boss, you'll be pleased to know that I put your picture you know, in a conspicuous place in my office, he just completely snowed Pat Gray. He, may, he was sort of like an Iago-type character, whispering in his ear, you know, there are a lot of reprobates here at the FBI who don't believe you ought to be director, but I'm with you and I'm against them. And to those people, he said, Pat Gray is a joke. We've got to get him out of here. He was a very deceptive man. Uh, when Felt came forward, or when his family put him forward in 2005, Pat Gray was still alive. And to his credit, George Stephanopoulos interviewed Pat Gray. And, when was, uh, and Gray was very ill. He died of, I think, stomach cancer not long afterwards. And it was um, a very emotional interview for him, because he said, I had no idea what a skilled liar Mark Felt was, because I confronted him to his face about whether he was leaking, and he denied it to my face, and I had no reason to disbelieve his word. 
with Woodward, like I say, I think at the time, to give him the benefit of the doubt, uh, Felt, you have to remember that Felt was um, you know, part of the bureau that did these COINTEL operations and deception and getting, and you know, sowing division in the US Communist Party or among the Black Panthers or the SDS. That was kind of a, a, a con that the FBI was very skilled at playing and Felt was part of that. And so I have no doubt that Woodward took him at face value and that he felt, made Woodward believe that they were allies in a common cause. And then for the follow-up, um, you had some conversations, discussions with John Dean, um, as it said at the end of your book. Were you at all concerned about his motives? I mean, what was your antenna telling you as Dean was talking to you? Well, that's a very interesting question. Even at this late date, John Dean is still trying to protect his reputation. Um, at one point uh, in my book, and this is not something I get into, in my book I also talk about what Felt knew and did not tell Woodward or Sandy Smith. Because if, if, if his motive really was to expose Watergate, there were things he did know about, such as the effort to embroil the CIA and block portions of the, of the FBI's investigation that he knew perfectly well about, yet he didn't tell Woodward. And I talk about that, and the person who was at the center of that was John Dean. And when he read that portion of the book, he really didn't like it, because it really showed that uh, you know, he was the desk officer for the cover-up. I mean, he does accept that title, but he doesn't like it to be shown what he really did. I have uh, three quick questions. Maybe they won't elicit quick answers, but uh, first of all, you mentioned there were a number of discrepancies between what Felt told Woodward and uh, what appeared, uh, and, and the truth, and I, I don't think you mentioned any of them. It'd be interesting to hear at least a couple of them. Um, Secondly, when the uh, when Felt came out, there was a lot of questioning again about some of the logistics that Woodward describes in the book about meeting in the garage and the New York Times uh, outside his door uh, every morning and how this could have possibly worked. And the third question is, you didn't mention Seymour Hersh of the New York Times, and I was curious if... Uh, how his coverage fit into your picture of this. Okay, I'll, I'll work backwards. Seymour Hersh uh, came to the New York Times precisely because it was perceived that it was beaten, being beat, badly beaten on the Watergate story. So he really doesn't arrive on the scene until January 73. And his first big story is that the burglars have been receiving hush money. That's, I think, in January 73. And what I'm writing about, or mostly is the period June to November 72. That's where Woodward and Bernstein got the great bulk of their leaks that counted from Mark Felt. Um, your second question was? The logistics of milk bottles and newspapers and meetings and parking garages. Oh, uh, a lot of people spent a lot of time on that, and I, I didn't find that that interesting. I mean, I think you know, on balance, probably some of that is exaggerated. I don't believe Felt, uh, you know, personally looked at Woodward's balcony to see if he was moving the flower pot. He probably had some underling do it for him. And, um, you know, compared to what I see as the, you know, the issues that count, I just, I mean, those are pretty trivial. Um, your first question was about the untruths Felt told Woodward. One of the untruths was that the hush money was being raised by the persons who had the most at stake, namely Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and Mitchell. And Mitchell left the committee to reelect because he couldn't ante up his portion, which is the hush money never came from anyone who worked in the White House or the committee to reelect. But probably the greatest single example of a falsehood, and I don't really know who invented it, because if you remember, there was this thing called the Canuck letter. 
This was supposedly a letter that helped destroy Ed Muskie's campaign in the spring of 1972, because apparently or allegedly he'd used the word Canucks, Canuck to refer to his constituents in Maine. Now, as an aside, Canuck is actually not a slur. I mean, you have a hockey team named the Vancouver Canucks, but um, in an October 10th, 1972 newspaper article, this allegation is made, and it's attributed to Ken Clausen, who was the director of communications at the White House. And it's in, emblazoned on the front page of the Washington Post. In the book, All the President's Men, Woodward says he had this meeting with Felt on October 9th. They were going over all the elements of the story. He was getting frustrated because Felt wouldn't be specific. So finally, as he was leaving, he said, what about the Canuck letter? And Felt said, allegedly, it was written on the grounds of the White House. Is that good enough for you? And that was the basis on which then Woodward went ahead and alleged that Ken Clausen was the author of it. Well, first of all, when the Watergate special prosecutor investigated that, they found that no one in the White House or the Nixon campaign had any responsibility for that letter. Not Ken Clausen, not anyone. It was not a Nixon dirty trick. Second of all, if you look at the text of Woodward's interview with Felt, there is no mention whatsoever of the Canuck letter. This is something that I referred to earlier, which appears in the book, but does not appear in the notes. And whether that's Woodward's um, improved memory or something that he invented to help support the Ken Clausen story, I, I don't really know. Wasn't Donald Segretti supposedly the person who wrote right. the Canuck letter? That was a suspicion, but they investigated and he was not responsible. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't read the book, but uh, curious about the uh, issue regarding the, the ultimate demise of Al Patrick Gray as a quote unquote acting director of the FBI. Isn't the reporting back then and all the history books say that? Uh, he and John Dean were privy to a file in E. Howard Hunt's safe that uh, was apparently procured at some point, and that this, quote, file was political dynamite, and that Al Patrick Gray participated in the uh, destruction of this evidence. It was supposedly tossed into a river in Connecticut. What are the facts? What do you know about it? And then just a brief comment. Uh, I would s dispute Hitchens' argument about unelected official with a hidden agenda that leaked. History shows it was J. Edgar Hoover, because he did it throughout his whole career. Well, I think he was referring to uh, the fact that there was such a dramatic correspondence between the leaks and this resignation of a president. That's, But you're absolutely correct, under the Bureau I mean, Hoover perfected the art of the leak. Um, what you're referring to are some documents that felt accepted from John Ehrlichman and John Dean, and it's partly because the FBI was leaking that I believe he accepted these documents. He was told they were from E. Howard Hunt's safe in the White House. He was told they had nothing to do with Watergate. They were reflecting these other political tricks Hunt was doing, and he took them home, and uh, as he was burning some of his Christmas wrapping paper, he remembered he had these documents. He opened them, he saw that they looked to be cables about the assassination of Diem, and he didn't feel they did have anything to do with Watergate, so he burned them. Um, when Dean turned state's evidence, he told the prosecutors about this. It was supposed to be hush-hush, you know, never to be disclosed. And Dean told the prosecutors, and at first Pat Gray tried to weasel out of it and deny that he ever received them, but then he realized he could get in trouble for perjury, so he did finally own up to admitting him. And that's what uh, led to his abrupt removal, because when it came clear that the FBI director had accepted evidence from E. Howard Hunt's safe and destroyed it, and it, it was over for him. Yes. 
I'm trying to put myself in Felt's place. He seems justified in being angry. And can you justify that Gray was a better choice as acting director than Felt or somebody else high up and experienced in the FBI? Well, I mean, there's no doubt that Felt believed he's entitled to the job. I think he had moved his family something like 17 times in the previous 25 years, um, traveled constantly. His wife essentially was a single parent because in order to rise in Hoover's bureaucracy, you had to put your job first. Um, but anyone I've talked to in the FBI believes what he did was completely uncalled for. I mean, if you talk to the special agent in charge of the Washington field office, who was the top supervisor of the agents who were investigating Watergate, I mean, he said to me, anyone who is a hero would not stay in the shadows for 30 years, and I defy anyone to show me why Felt had to leak in order to advance the FBI's investigation. Because we were, I'm that sorry. That wasn't my question. Mm -hmm. My question was, was Pat Gray really a good choice? Oh. Better than Felt or somebody else? Well, I, I think Pat Gray was certainly a more honest man than, than Mark Felt, number one. I don't know how good he would have been as FBI director. I mean, the man who succeeded Hoover was in for a world of trouble because the FBI, and to this day, I think if you uh, got Robert Mueller, you know, got him one or two drinks, he'd talk about the insularity of that culture. It's, it's, I mean, they got so used to acting with impunity and being able to get away with anything. I mean, no attorney general had ever controlled Hoover. And that bred a sense of intransigence, lack of cooperation with other government agencies, uh, willfulness, you know, not communicating what they were doing. I mean, any number of things. Nixon had been a great friend of Hoover's, but Hoover ended up frustrating him no end because he felt he wasn't doing an adequate job. And he wanted to force him out. But uh, one of the things, surprising things I found about Nixon is he had the hardest time firing people. I mean, he had this reputation of being somewhat ruthless, but when it came to getting rid of people, he was a milk toast, really. Regardless of the method, the second class burglary that you talked about, supposedly the objective of that second class burglary was to discover uh, foreign agencies, payment from foreign agencies or foreign governments to the Democratic National Committee. Was that ever further uh, investigated or looked into? Or was anything ever found? Well, that's what the Cubans were told, and that's why they cooperated. They had been told that Castro wanted the Democrats to win and that he was secretly funneling money to the Democratic National Committee. Uh, the best explanation I've heard, well, first let me say the, the person who really knows why they broke into the Democratic National Committee is Gordon Liddy. And he's never said why. I mean, he was the, it was his brainchild. He was the one who proposed it. He was the one who supervised it. And he's never explained it. And I think one reason is because it was his stupid mistake to put James McCord on that team of burglars, a man who worked for the Nixon campaign. Uh, if McCord had not been on that team and they'd arrested a bunch of Cubans and maybe an Anglo who had no tie to the Republicans, Watergate might never have happened. But the fact is, it did happen, and I think the reason they went into there was, I think the best explanation I've ever heard uh, was the one John Dean told me, which was in the spring of 1972, there was a big controversy involving ITT, International Telephone and Telegraph, giving funds to the Republicans in return for a favorable antitrust ruling, and Richard Kleindienst nomination as attorney general was held up because of, or was controversial because of that allegation. 
and I think what the Liddy's team was looking for was something similar that they could use against the Democrats, showing that some kind of corporate funds had gone into the Democratic coffers to support their convention, and it would be embarrassing if disclosed. So did they not pursue that line? Did the press or anybody pursue the line whether the Democratic National Committee had received these funds, foreign funds, or? To uh, my knowledge, no one ever found any, funds from Castro going to the DNC, no. If I had read the book, I probably wouldn't be asking this question. <clears throat> but I'm trying to understand Felt's motives. And you have uh, said that he aspired to uh, being head of the FBI. Um, and you also said that he told Patrick Gray that he wasn't leaking. And C Patrick Gray believed him. So apparently, if Nixon knew that uh, Felt was leaking, Nixon had other sources in the FBI that were informing him. But if Nixon knew this, then how did he expect that he was going to be appointed by Nixon to head the FBI? Okay, well that's a very good question. First of all, Felt did not know that Nixon knew he was leaking initially. <clears throat> Number one, he only learned that later after the election when Gray came to him and said, look, Richard Kleindienst has told me that there's an allegation that you're the one who leaked all those stories to the Washington Post. What do you have to say about it? And Felt denied it up, down, and sideways, and Gray believed him. <clears throat> now, one thing I spent a lot of time trying to discover is this chain of information that reaches Nixon about how he learned that Felt was leaking. <clears throat> In the conversation, Haldeman tells him we found the leak, and it's very high up. It's the man next to Pat Gray, Mark Felt. And Nixon expresses amazement. He doesn't know Mark Felt that well, but he knows who he is. Why would he be doing such a thing? And then he thinks he's Jewish for a while. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, when Haldeman explains this to him, he says, we learn this information from the, a lawyer who works for the offending publication, who used to work in the Justice Department before he worked for the offending publication, and he finds what Felt is doing to be you know, completely uncalled for. <clears throat> now, Haldeman had been told that information by John Dean, and I talked to Dean because, of course, Haldeman and Nixon weren't around to ask, Dean said in turn he had been told it by Henry Peterson, who was the um, head of the criminal division and the Justice Department. Peterson, unfortunately, is also not around. I looked in Peterson's file to see maybe who had called him that day. Could never get to the bottom of it. And I really don't know which of the offending publications was being talked to, whether it was uh, talked about as. Dean assumed it was the Post, but there's ample reason to believe it was Time Magazine and not the Post. Um, I looked into all the counsel who worked either for the Washington Post or Time Magazine. There was one lawyer who was involved in the Washington Post who had worked in the Justice Department. I called him up and asked him about this, and he persuaded me it wasn't him. So I really don't have a good answer. And of course, since the story went from this Council to Peterson to Dean to Haldeman, you know, who knows how it maybe got changed. But the fact is, Nixon knew Felt was leaking by October. Felt believed that he had pulled the wool over Gray's eyes and that no one believed it. I mean, Felt was, uh, you know, a very clever and dishonest person, but he was also very vain and he could deceive himself too. I mean, he believed, despite these allegations, that. You know, he had persuaded everyone that he wasn't doing it. He continued to believe he was a strong candidate for weeks, months after October 72. And there was, I mean, if you listen to the Nixon tapes from February, March, and April, at every opportunity he rails against Mark Felt, but he still doesn't want to be personally responsible for firing him.
Hi, this might be a silly question, but um, Mark Felt was known as Deep Throat, and if he was known to Nixon, he was known to others, and he was, and I don't know, as a little middle schooler and all the president's men, he kind of captured our imagination as being this mysterious ghost in the garage, but apparently others knew about him. How did he maintain his an anonymity? anonymity for so long and um, basically he was until he was he passed away no one knew who it was how did yeah. he how well, that, did that that's actually a very good question <laughs> gets into <clears throat> something I didn't talk about which is uh, how all the president's men came to be written um, originally they signed that book in October or November 1972, and it was going to be a quick book about the Watergate scandal, everything they couldn't put in the newspaper because there wasn't time and space. It was going to be a book about the scandal, you know, what we couldn't write in the newspaper. And the book was due about a year after it was signed. <clears throat> Woodward and Bernstein had never written a book. So uh, in the spring of 73, suddenly Watergate explodes. And how do you write a book about a scandal when every day you open the newspaper and the scandal's bigger than it was the day before? So they actually thought about returning their advance because they hadn't written a word and they were you know, writing stories for the newspaper. Then they had this serendipitous meeting with Robert Redford. Redford had read their coverage. He had actually met Richard Nixon when he was in high school in California in 1962, I think, when Nixon was running for governor, and took an immediate dislike to him. <laughs> and uh, become very interested in this Woodward and Bernstein guys, you know, two guys who were doggedly pursuing this story when you know, everybody else in the press was supposedly laying down. And he wanted, uh, as soon as he heard that they had contracted to write a book, he wanted to sign it up for a movie. But what interested him was not the scandal, but the reporters, the mutton Jeff, you know, Jewish leftist from Maryland and Midwestern Wheaton, Illinois, son of a judge who went to Yale and served in the Navy. So he wanted to do a film about the mutton Jeff nature of their relationship, um, the but, you know, a buddy movie. And so Woodward had a meeting with him in the spring of 73, and he explained their problem, you know, thinking of returning events, and Redford said, write the book that I'm interested in. Don't write it about Watergate, which is an ending. Write it about your coverage in 1972. Write it about yourself. So the whole axis of the book changed. And so, well, how do you write that book? Well, if you're going to write about how you got that story, you have to write about your sources. So Woodward and Bernstein went back to their sources, like Hugh Sloan and Judith Hoback, and asked for permission to reveal their identity. Hugh Sloan didn't care at all, because he'd always told the truth, and I guess he thought it was a chance to rehabilitate his reputation. Judith Hoback said, don't use my name, but you can you know, call me the bookkeeper. When they asked Mark Felt, or Woodward said they asked Mark Felt, he said, hell no. Because the deal with Woodward had been, you are not to quote anything I say, you are not to acknowledge my existence to anybody, everything I tell you is for a quote, deep background. You're not to uh, link me to any particular story. Now, Woodward had violated those rules a little, but uh, you know, not too badly for a reporter. <laughs> <laughs> but when he had this problem with Felt, you know, what's he going to do? I mean, Felt was not their only source, but he was first among equals. He was Deep Throat. He was their most important source. So he thought about it for a while, and they actually floated some trial balloons. There's one article in the Washington Post in June of 1973 about the traumatic year at the FBI and how the place, the reputation of the place has plummeted in the year of Watergate. 
and according to a Watergate repertorial specialist, there's one guy at the FBI without whom we couldn't have written a word. Well, that was either Woodward or Bernstein telling this Post reporter about their big source at the FBI. I saw it as a, when I read that as a, as a way, well, maybe tr trying to signal felt it wouldn't be that bad for you to be exposed as a source. But at the end of the day, they decided to write their book and they violated virtually every stipulation. They tied Felt to specific sources. They quoted extensively what he had told Woodward. They acknowledged his ex existence. The only things they didn't reveal were where he worked in the executive branch. They just said he worked in the executive branch. And of course, they didn't reveal his name. <clears throat> Felt immediately became the chief suspect for Deep Throat. There was a fabled Washington editor named Frank Waldrop, who had written for the Washington Times Herald since the 1920s. He had witnessed the growth of the FBI from this teeny office in the Justice Department to the powerhouse that Hoover had built. He immediately said, Deep Throat is Mark Felt. And if you look at the initial coverage and speculation, Mark Felt is the number one suspect. So he said, it is not I, it was not I. He lied. And meanwhile, this fable grew up about Woodward's fidelity to his sources, which I find one of the oddest things about the whole thing. I mean, he betrayed Felt. He violated their agreement when it suited his purposes. And Felt actually, this is in my book, was investigated internally by the FBI for leaking after he'd left. And he was extremely angry about it. Uh, and he denied it and, of course, lied about it, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> but he, in the end, the FBI couldn't prove anything about it. So, you know, as time goes on, you have Felt's denial. And so other people, well, who was this person in the executive branch? And the speculation gets more Baroque. You know, Alexander Haig, John Dean, Earl Silbert, uh, just all sorts of, you know, Fred Fielding, just all, uh, all sorts of wild. Pat Gray was fingered by <laughs> CBS, I think, at one point, as Deep Throat. Um, so it just gets wilder and wilder, you know. Um, and Woodward, you know, is the keeper of the secret. Um, finally, he goes to visit Felt when Felt is, you know, nearly senile. Felt has a reaction to seeing him, a strong reaction that his daughter notices, you know, because he doesn't react that way to many people. And one thing leads to another, and they, the family, uh, decides that he is deep throat. And on days when he's more clear-headed, he does admit it, but. You know, the next day he denies it. I myself am, am convinced that if he were, you know, compass mentis until the end of his days, he never would have come forward because he knew he couldn't withstand any scrutiny. And therefore, he didn't want to be identified as deep throat. If he'd done something truly heroic, he might have been modest and a bashful hero, but he eventually would have come forward. But he knew that anybody who knew anything about what had actually gone on in the FBI would find him you know, a reprobate for what he did. And he would be excommunicated from the only community he had, which was former FBI agents. OK, last question. Yes. So I'd just like to take a minute. When I'm finished, I'd like to hear what you've got to say in answer to my idea. Why does it matter? I remember Watergate very well. I'm sure most folks here do also. June 17, 1972, it's a big day in Boston, Bunker Hill game. And I'll never forget, a friend of mine, Summers born that day too, same day. But how about politics? Uh, when we found out that it was the creep, the committee to reelect the president, Mitchell was in charge of that, and uh, Mr. Nixon met with them once a week. He was so paranoid about losing the election because, you know, you remember what happened then with Kennedy in 1960, and this is 72, he's up for re-election. <laughs> so naturally, he was in touch with them. He knew what they were doing. And any American with half a brain 
well, would expect that Nixon was in on it, and then the natural thing would be try to cover up to protect the boys he sent out. It's natural uh, for any president. Uh, we hold the president responsible. That's why Papa Bush wasn't reelected, Carter wasn't reelected, Herbert Hoover wasn't reelected right along. The captain is responsible for the ship. Everybody knows that. And still, Richard Nixon was overwhelmingly reelected that year. Almost like a landslide, LBJ, uh, you know, uh, FDR in 36 images, unbelievable. American people knew they weren't about Watergate. Nobody had his head cracked in the hospital. Nobody was shot. One politician after another, nobody gave a hoot. Was the Judiciary Committee was mainly Democrat, and it barely passed a vote to recommend to the full House, you know, a bill of impeachment. And then Goldwater knocks on the door and gave the red, we can't protect him, and he said, blah, blah, blah. And it was a big scandal. We're still writing and talking. Why does it matter? Do you well, think it would have happened if the Judiciary Committee was mainly Republican? Do you think that they would have recommended a bill of impeachment? No, no. I don't think so. Uh, but let me just, which doesn't mean that they shouldn't have, but yes, <laughs> let me just say that, you know, the reasons why Nixon, um, you know, just didn't come clean, get rid of the people who did it, say that, you know, these are subordinates who went haywire. You know, it's a very complicated issue, and John Dean was the one who sort of schooled me in it. You know, the fact was that Liddy and Hunt if they had just been responsible for the break-in, he probably would have, you know, owned up to these subordinates who did these things and gotten rid of them, and that would have been the end of it. But the fact is, they had been involved in a break-in at the office of the psychiatrist of Daniel Ellsberg, which was clearly illegal. I mean, the break-in was illegal too, but I mean, this was, uh, you know, pretty outrageous. And it was that knowledge that Nixon was worried, it was that information that Nixon was worried about c coming out. Now that break-in had been supervised by John Ehrlichman. And Mitchell had been the, uh, essentially the higher up in the break-in at the DNC. Mitchell and Ehrlichman didn't get along. Mitchell didn't want to take a fall for something he felt Ehrlichman you know, had been chiefly responsible for, and of course Ehrlichman felt that Mitchell ought to just come clean and that'll be the end of it. So it had a lot to do with, you know, the internal divisions within the White House. And Nixon, as I alluded to earlier, was very loyal to the people who worked with him. John Mitchell was an old friend. He'd been his campaign manager in 1968. He didn't feel he would have been president without Mitchell. And so, you know, the obvious course, which is just to cut these Watergate people off at the knees and get them out of the way, he just couldn't follow that, or he didn't think he could. And of course, um, he never dreamt that his tapes would ever become public, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You say you're legal. Nixon's a lot of risk, I mean, blocking, How do they reelect George Bush? <laughs> <laughs> to the Ford Presidential Library for programs of intellectual challenge and provocation, and we've had some tonight. We're so glad you're here. We have a gift for you, Max, which is not one, but two sets with the signature of our favorite president, wow. Gerald R. Ford, and we hope you will use them in good health, but also use them in your book signing afterwards. Thank so thank you so much thank for being so much. here. Thank you. Thank you.